Hello all, Rick here with a quick video exploring another Trek technology. In Star Trek we hear this term, ablative armour, a lot, especially in reference to the USS Defiant, the first true, not a warship it's just an escort starship that Starfleet produces. But what exactly is it and why was it deemed necessary? Starship hulls are generally constructed from several metals and alloys, but most commonly Duranium-235. Other materials were used by other species, but Starfleet favoured this durable metal since their first spacecraft in at least the 2150s. It's not stated if Duranium is an alloy or an element in canon, but it seems to be the latter, mined from deep within a planet's crust. Although the outer layers of the hull were forged from this material, other materials were layered under the duranium, such as tritanium, a substance 21.4 times as hard as diamond, polyduranide, and standard titanium. There were often other materials still, but these seem to be the most common, with Starfleet vessels utilising at least several of them in the construction of their hulls. These materials were selected for several purposes, the obvious being the protection it provided against debris and possible impacts, but also because much of the unfiltered radiation of space could not penetrate the hull of a ship. If there was radiation that could, well then often the deflector shields could handle that, and it was only a small amount of intense radiations that could cause any concern, bypassing both shielding and the outer hull. So, as you can see, this powerful combination of science fiction materials is incredibly difficult to bypass withstanding the beams of even hand phasers on high settings, at least for a time. So that's withstanding at most 130 million joules of energy, as estimated by award-winning science educator, entertainer and golden-locked shenaniganeer Kyle Hill. The disruptor, or phaser banks, of a starship, however, different story. These could boil through even Duranium with a direct hit, giving you some idea of the ludicrous levels of power at play within the Star Trek universe, so I'm not going to keep up with all the actual figures of power, heat resistance and tensile strengths of these materials because frankly, it just causes all sorts of plot holes to open up because, like the speed of warp drive, you're not supposed to think about it too much. In the early days, ships used to rely simply on outer hull layers of extra thick hull plating to absorb these attacks, and could further polarise the hull to render a fraction of the impacting energy weapon inert. This was not amazingly effective, as eventually the polarisation would be rendered null, but it's better than nothing, <laughs> until the advent of shields. After shielding, Starfleet saw little reason to delve back into older hull armours. But when Starfleet encountered the Borg in 2365, it became apparent to the crew of the Galaxy-class Enterprise just how underpowered they were when confronting the Borg head-on. The Borg's cutting beam technology by itself was enough to surgically remove a portion of the hull, and the Enterprise's shields were next to useless, so Starfleet began to develop counters to all this. As the Defiant was prototyped to combat the Borg, that it seems likely that the ablative armour was developed alongside this project, or at least folded into its development, as it was the first vessel we see with this installed, albeit at a later date. By 2371, it was ready for active service and installed on the USS Defiant, Later models of Starship that were expected to face combat, such as the Prometheus class, were constructed to include ablative armour from day one. The exact makeup of this armour is not stated, from its composition to its structure, but it covers almost the entire surface of a vessel and is a great example of Starfleet's innovation and aptitude to working smart. Rather than simply piling on layers and layers of extra duranium, this thin 1.75cm coating called the Armour Matrix is actually designed to be destroyed. That is to say that when it takes an impact from an energy weapon, it disperses the energy across its segmented matrix and allows it to burn away at a controlled rate. This mitigates the heat, force and overall damage imparted by the shot, spreading it across a wider area and time in a similar way that a Kevlar vest disperses an impact. 
Now, this does also mean that damaged armour needs to be replaced between combat encounters, which is a time consuming repair job, and that after an area has taken too much punishment there will be no ablative armour left in that particular spot, but hopefully by then well, you've gotten your shields operational or gotten away from the enemy. The ablative armour system was further expanded upon by the 25th century, at least in the defunct timeline that Admiral Janeway overwrote. Rather than the time consuming process of coating an entire vessel in these ablative segments, a new armour deployment system was developed that would unfold the protective layer all over the surface of a vessel at a much thicker state, possibly using replicators or some early form of programmable matter. Technically, as of the return of 2379 Voyager, the Starfleet has access to this advanced tech, but whether or not they choose to use it depends on how much they want to stick to their Temporal Prime Directive. Of course, even this ingenious defensive measure pales in comparison to a thin coating of solid neutronium, but then again neutronium is dense and coating your entire vessel in it would turn it into a lumbering hulk that required like 10 warp cores to manoeuvre. Probably. So there we have it. That is basically ablative armour, a clever defence layer employed to provide your ship with the ability to weather a few more hits, and often that extra time is all that's needed. I've been Rick, thank you for watching and I'll catch you later for another video. Goodbye.